we are here with the world's number one executive coach, Marshall Goldsmith. He also happens to have been a very special person in my life, a mentor of mine. He's a pioneer of a tool we may be familiar with, the 360. He's traveled over 11 million miles on American Airlines alone. Marshall Goldsmith, what an incredible pleasure to have you with us today. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. It's great to see you. It is great to see you, my friend. And this is the view from Marshall's new home. So Marshall, we see it's a tough life you live. When I met you first, it was 20, it was half a lifetime ago. I was 22, I think. You had just flown in to New York. And I actually got an interview with you while driving you from the airport over to a party we were holding. Right. On that drive over, you said something fascinating. You said, you know, as we got to know each other, a friend of mine pointed out that at this one point in my life when I was trying to be normal, he said, stop trying to, to pretend you're normal. You're not. We all know you're not. Right. Now, this is my world. Welcome to the world I live in. All the visionaries, the CEOs, the people that we play with every day, they're all eccentric. They're all pariahs. What are the benefits of normalcy and what are the, the cons of normalcy? Clearly, you've tried both and you identify with us who are not the normal people. Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. And I think also normal at what? because parts of my life actually are quite normal. I've been married for 46 years. I, you know, dress in a really, I normally wear a green shirt every day, except I have a green screen with my picture, so I have to have a blue shirt. I normally wear the same clothes all the time. So I have a lot of elements in my life that are quite normal, lived in the same house for 41 years. Wait, wait, wait. You're saying wearing the same shirt every day is normal? Keep well, going. that's true. I'm that's just not really normal. <laughs> good point, good point. But so parts are normal, yet parts are not normal, and that's the creative parts, coming up with new and different ideas. And I think the, re the reality is, another word I'm going to give you is risk, because how much risk do people want to take? And in some cases, risk is a fantastic idea. In some cases, it isn't. And I guess in hindsight, if you win, it looks like you're a genius when you take risk. And if you don't, it looks like you're an idiot. So, you know, is it worth it? And it's a very interesting thing. Uh, I've heard of your book, Big Hairy Audacious Goals, right? Uh, it was in the book, A Good to Great, which means it says you should, if you want to be a success, you should have big, hairy, audacious goals, which I totally believe in. Also, they could have written, if you want to be a waitress in Hollywood, you should have big, hairy, audacious goals, because they all did. They all had a big, hairy, audacious goals, and they're waiting on tables. So I think, you know, it's, it's good to take a risk. It's also good to reflect on, you know, when and what. Let me give an example. I've got this group I work with called 100 Coaches, where I give away everything to these people. And it's a very interesting idea, but some of the people are more entrepreneurial risk takers. And for example, some are in the speaking business and going into this year, they were more glamorous, big selling books, you know, and the corporate people in the group were less glamorous, more boring. Well, today the corporate people are a lot better off. You know, they're eating, they have jobs, they have incomes and the other people have got Zippo. They're just looking at a year of nothing. So it really, it's hard to say, I think it's a personal choice. How much risk do you want to take? How much risk do you want to take? And when you take a risk, you have to be an adult and you face the fact that, yeah, I'm taking a risk and I may end up being a big success and I may end up falling on my ass. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's your call. And, and to me, if you do want to be a big success, you have to take a risk. If you want to be normal, you're going to get normal, which is normal. If you want to be different than normal, you have to try to be different than normal. Yeah, so it's a it's it's an interesting, interesting existential decision. How much do you trust your gut? And I, let me lead up to that a little bit. Another wacky thing you've done since I've known you. There's no shortage of these. You showed me your New York City apartment, and then you shared right. with me how you actually came upon the apartment. You drove up the JFK, the east side of Manhattan. You right. did a loop, drove down the west side. Said, "Nice location." You walked in, said, "I'll take one of those." Right, well, they, the had a, they, had, they had a special that day. If they you had a special. Met, I, I was with my daughter. And so she just got dumped by her boyfriend. 
And she was at Yale getting her PhD and she was kind of just sad. So I said, well, let's get your place in the city because New Haven kind of sucks anyway. So we were driving down. I said, oh, that looks nice. I've come to the city a lot. Let's get in a condo. So we look around and then I, had to, I walked in and I was set X dollars I was going to spend. And then they said, special today, American Express Platinum Card. You can put a down payment on that. So I said, I, I have American Express Platinum Card <laughs> here. And <laughs> my daughter goes crazy. Daddy's going crazy. He calls my wife. Daddy's crazy. Daddy's crazy. So I just bought this condo. <laughs> At the time, I think it was a million dollars. And it's here, here. I just bought it. And it worked out in the end. It was all fine. Did more than work out for a million bucks. That's the bargain of a century. Now yeah. you knock down a wall. Yeah, then my friend, apartments with your neighbor. Now this is yeah, not well, something friend, well, most people do. My right? friend Mark Thompson, who's my great buddy, so he's going to get a condo. So I said, why don't you buy the one next to me? We'll knock down the walls, and then we'll have three bedrooms and three baths, two thousand square foot mega view home. So we did. So anyway, it was great fun. You know, so that was about oh, I don't know, twelve years ago or so. But it was, uh, you know, it's a great time. Awesome. Let's get into the world of coaching. As CEOs, we're all coaches to some extent. We're helping others grow. Right. Listening is one of the things over the last couple decades I've seen from you is incredibly important, immeasurably relevant across so many different contexts. Apart from listening, which we kind of all know is just so important, what else would you say is precious for CEOs to have as one of their skill sets or competencies? Well, one thing I'm a great believer in is that everyone I coach gets feedback. They get confidential feedback from everyone around them. Then they learn to not only get the feedback, they learn to accept the feedback, thank people for the feedback, apologize for their mistakes, follow up and get measured. And I did a study called Leadership as a Context Board. If you look at the study, I mean, it always works. And in my coaching, as you know, I don't get paid if they don't get better. So there's a great way to test if someone believes what they're saying. Just ask one question. Do you want to bet on it? They say, I believe it, but I wouldn't bet on it. Well, they don't believe in it that much. They say, here's the money. They believe in it. I bet on this every time. Well, what do they have to do? One, they have to have the courage to look in the mirror. Very hard. Two, they have to have the humility to admit they can improve. Because you know what I've learned? I cannot help someone who's perfect get better. I've learned that. You, know, you can't improve on perfection. So if they're already perfect, why talk to me? Waste of time. And then three, they have to have the discipline to do the hard work to do it. And it's not easy. If you read any of my books, like you read my book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, you read funny story after funny story after funny story. Well, it's tempting to read the book and think these people are idiots. Well, the people in the book all have IQs of 150, and they're mostly CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies. They're not idiots. They'll tell you this stuff is pretty easy to understand. It's just very hard to do. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to say there's one thing separate from listening that these smart 150 plus IQ genius CEOs have benefited from, what's that one thing? Wave a wand you'd love to pass along to other CEOs out there. You don't always have to win. Uh, in my book, you know, what's the number one problem of everyone I work with winning too much. And we have a perverse need to win and to be right. Uh, most of my clients have taken test after test, after test, after test in their life, literally hundreds or thousands of tests. They had one goal, prove how smart they were over and over and over and over and over again. It's very hard to stop doing that. And as you get promoted, what you have to do is let go of always winning and being smart and being right and let other people win and be smart and be right. This is quite easy in theory and quite difficult in practice because it's so ingrained in our behavior. Uh, one of the things I talk about is uh, adding too much value. An example of that, I'm young, smart, enthusiastic, you're my boss, I come to you with an idea and you think it's a great idea. Rather than just saying great idea, we say, well, that's a nice idea. Why don't you add this to it? Well, the problem is the quality of the idea may go up 5%. My commitment to execute may go down 50%. It's no longer my idea, boss. Now it's your idea. And incredibly hard for smart, successful people not to constantly go through life proving we're smart, adding value, winning pointless arguments, and, and to say, breathe. 
one of my good coaching clients was J.P. Garnier, CEO of GlaxoSmithKline. And I asked him, what did you learn about leadership as a CEO of this company? And he said, I learned the hard lesson. My suggestions are orders. He said, if they're smart, they're orders. If they're stupid, they're orders. If I want them to be orders, they're orders. If I don't, they're orders anyway. For nine years, I coached the admirals in the Navy. What's the first thing I teach them? When they get this start, your suggestions are orders. Admirals don't make suggestions. When an admiral makes a suggestion, what's the response? Sir, yes, sir. A suggestion is an order. So I asked JP, what did you learn from me when I was your coach? He said, you taught me one lesson, helped me be a better leader and have a happier life. I said, what was it? He said, before I speak, breathe and ask myself one question. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? He said, half the time as a CEO of GlaxoSmithKline, what did I determine? Am I right? Maybe. Is it worth it? Nope. Hmm. So when we got together so many times, you've had this fantastic ritual. Ah. Now, when you do that fantastic breath that everybody makes a lot of fun of you for, they love you for it. But by the way, that lives, that lives on like a legacy in our community. People do that all over the place. When you do that, I mean, it feels good to breathe for breathing's sake. Are you asking yourself things other than just, is it worth it at times? Do you breathe for go. breath's sake? Take us into the breath. What's, what's in that breath? Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. And we often <sighs> carry stuff around, you know. Uh, I'm a Buddhist. Yeah, let it go. Let it go. And uh, don't have to win. Don't have to be right. Don't have to add value. Let it go. Love it. So we've got a breath. We've got the 360. So many tools that you can pull out of your arsenal. What are some of the other tools that have been especially powerful in affecting change in CEOs? One of the things I'm, I have really worked on more and more over the years is called the daily question process. Now, I'll describe that in our call. The daily question process takes three minutes a day, costs absolutely nothing, will help everybody get better at almost anything, no matter what country you're in. Some people are skeptical. Three minutes a day costs nothing, help me get better at almost anything. That sounds ridiculous, too good to be true. Half the people that start doing this quit within two weeks. And they don't quit because it does not work. They quit because it does work. This is incredibly easy to understand and incredibly difficult to do. How does it work? Well, get out a spreadsheet. On one column, you write down a series of questions that represent what is most important in your life. Friends, family, colleagues, health, work, whatever it is, anything you want. Every question is answered with a yes, a no, or a number. Yes is represented with a one, no is a zero or a number. Seven boxes across on that spreadsheet. Every day you fill it out. Now at the end of the week, that spreadsheet gives you a report card. And having done this for many years, I've learned some. That report card at the end of the week, it's not as beautiful as a corporate values plaque she's stuck up on the wall. You do this every day, you learn something very quickly. You learn that life is incredibly easy to talk. Life is incredibly difficult to live. And if you do this every day, you don't look at those talking values, which are really pretty. You look at the live values. Not so beautiful. You know, I, I screw up something every day. I'm amazed at my skill in screwing up something every day. Well, every day you get to look at it. You know, Josh, have you ever impressed yourself with your incredible skill at screwing something up almost every day? Every day. <laughs> every day. Every day. Never make a miss there. Well, you know, you get to look at it every day, and it's not so good, not so pretty there looking at that thing every day. So I have someone call me on the phone every day just to make sure I do this. Someone said, now, why do you have someone call you on the phone every day? Don't you know the theory about how to change behavior? See, I, I wrote the theory about how to change behavior. That's why I have someone call me on the phone every day. I know how hard this is. You see, Josh, the reason I have someone call me on the phone is uh, m my name is Marshall Goldsmith. I got ranked number one executive coach and leadership thinker in the whole world. I have somebody call me on the phone every day. They just listen to me, read questions I wrote, and provide answers I wrote every day. Now, why do I do that? I'm too cowardly to do this by myself. I'm too undisciplined to do this by myself. I need help. And it's okay. It's okay to need help. 
We all need help. Look at my book, Triggers. 27 major CEOs endorsed that book. Why am I so proud of that? 30 years ago, no CEO would admit to having a coach. They would have been ashamed, embarrassed to have a coach. Today, these are people saying, hey, I'm president of the World Bank. I need help. It's okay. I'm CEO of the year in the United States. I need help. I'm number two CEO of the year in the United States. I need help. I won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I need help. Who are we kidding? We all need help. Now, how does this back to the daily question? Every day you fill it out. Now, I'm going to share some of my questions, but they're not intended to be yours. So, Josh, I'll send you an email with an article about this and my own questions that you can distribute to everyone. No use having to take notes about this. One of my questions is, you know, how many times yesterday did you try to prove you were right when it wasn't worth it? I don't see too many zeros on that scorecard. Now, Josh, have you ever attempted to prove you were right when it was not worth it? When's the last time you did that, trying to prove Josh was right when it wasn't worth it? Give me a case study. He's thinking. Another question. Um, how many angry or destructive comments did you make about people yesterday? Don't see so many zeros on that one either. Uh, how many steps did you take? How many push-ups, sit-ups? Uh, did I say to something nice for my wife, my daughter, my son? Just simple questions about life. Now, my friend Jim Moore, who does this with me, would tell you this saved his life. It did not kind of save his life or sort of save his life. It did save his life. What's one of his questions? Are you currently updated on your physical examination? The first 90 days he did this, he said no every day. After 90 days, he said, this is embarrassing. I've got to get the dumb exam or quit asking the question. You got the dumb exam. What the doctor said, you have cancer. He's going to be fine. That was many years ago. The doctor also said, had you waited seven months, you'd be dead. He knew he should have got a physical exam. Just didn't do it. How many of us put off that physical exam, right? How about the trip to the dentist? Have you ever noticed a, a flurry of dental flossing activity the two days before you walk into that dentist's office, flossing away, blood's running all out of your mouth. Have, the dentist says, have you been flossing? Oh, yeah, yeah, dentist. I was flossing. Sure, dentist, yes, of course. Are we fooling the dentist here? No. We're fooling the doctor. Who are we fooling? Now, finally, the added variable on this is I'm now going to recommend six questions for everybody. Six questions. The first, and they all begin with the phrase, did I do my best to? Did I do my best to? Now, why is that so important? Because if I ask you, did you find meaning, to, would you have a meaningful day? You say, no, it's, well, they made me do trivia. Are you happy? No, my aunt died last week. It's their fault. But if I say, did I do my best too, we take responsibility. The first question is, did I do my best to set clear goals? Not did someone set clear goals for me, did I do my best to set clear goals for myself? And you'd be shocked listening to the people I talk to. Every week, by the way, Josh, I do this every weekend with 50 really amazing people. These people include like Curtis Martin, who's in the National Football League Hall of Fame, Pau Gasol, the basketball player, Telly Lung, a Broadway star, uh, CEO of Cardinal Hell, president of the World Bank. I mean, all kinds of great people. Every I, week. I got, I got to interrupt you to give you just a live read here. I can feel electricity as you walk through these questions. There's this vibration of frequency it resonates on that is nothing short of incredible. I mean, I can feel the quality of life improving. Keep going. I mean, this is tremendous. Tremendous Thank you. Ammunition. Number one, did I do my best to set clear goals? Number two, and by the way, you might think all these people like coach who are all like so achievers, they'd all get a 10 every day. No. Some days they're like two, three. We get lost. We just get lost. You wake up, oh, I got email, another email. Eh. Next thing you look at it's five o'clock. What the hell happened? You know, and what was, what was my goal today? I guess we're responding to shit because that's all I did all day, just respond. Number two, did I do my best to make progress toward achieving my goals? So did I, you know, you set the goal, did I actually do anything to make progress? Number three, did I do my best to find meaning? So rather than saying, did somebody else give me meaning? Did I do my best to create meaning myself and find meaning in whatever I did? Number four, and we're going to spend some time on number four, did I do my best to be happy? 
Now, it doesn't say you were happy. Did I do my best to be happy? Now, in my book, Triggers, I talk about three medical doctors. Now, obviously, I have the rights to use their names. They're in the book. One of them is my friend, Dr. Jim Kim. Uh, Dr. Kim was president of World Bank. He was president of Dartmouth College, um, head of partners in health. He, an amazing man, uh, probably saved 20 million lives in his, in his career. It's just been done some phenomenal things. Uh, he also has a simultaneous MD and PhD with honors from Harvard in anthropology it's in five years. A normal person to get a PhD in anthropology from Harvard takes eight years. He had one in five years and had an MD at the same time. So when the brains were passed out, he wasn't like the back of the line. Another one of the people is Dr. John Noseworthy. Dr. John, he was president of Mayo Clinic. And then another one is uh, Dr. Ross Shaw, who's head of the Rockefeller Foundation. And he was formerly head of USAID at age 37, reporting to Hillary Clinton, who was Secretary of State. These are three most brilliant people I ever met. All three individually ask him a question. How are you scoring an average day on, did I do my best to be happy? All three had exactly the same answer. It never dawned on me to try to be happy. They're all so busy achieving crap. It never dawned, and then they're all medical doctors. So I said, well, now you're a medical doctor. They're in medical school, then they teach you about death. You know, we're all gonna die. Did they cover that one in medical school? I said, oh, yeah, yeah. They, they covered that in medical school. They're very familiar with the concept of die. Well, I said, do you think this is a stupid question? They all said, no, it's important. I forgot to ask. You see, my favorite line in my book, Triggers, involves this interaction. It says, even the best sharpshooter can miss a very big target. Even the best sharpshooter can miss a very big target. These were three brilliant guys. They were missing a big target every day. Well, average score on did I do my best to be happy, 5.5 out of 10 for the people I work with. And then I say, okay, you got an MBA from Harvard. How many tests did you score 5.5 out of 10 in school? And I say, this test was way more important than those bullshit tests at school. Yeah. So it's a good one. Did I do my best to be happy? And no matter what the situation is, did I do my best to be as happy as I could be in the situation? Then did I do my best to build positive relationships? And finally, did I do my best to be fully engaged? Rather than saying, did the company engage me? Did I engage myself? And that was hard. I mean, a, Bud a Buddhist term is to me a very parallel term, mindfulness. Engagement to me and mindfulness are almost the same thing. Mindfulness to me is not meditating. Mindfulness is being awake and aware of what you're doing when you're doing it. And it's so easy to get lost, to forget where we are. You're at home with your family, looking at the cell phone. Um, you forget your kids. You're at work thinking about something else. It's very, very hard to be where we are. So one of the questions I ask myself every day is what percent of yesterday were you mindful? My average score is about a 30%. I doubt I even deserve that. Most of the time, we're not very mindful. We're just wandering around like a pinball, bouncing around on a pinball machine. Now, I'm going to give everybody a very good, simple technique that's really going to help with presence and mindfulness. Are we ready? Get out a little piece of paper, a card, a notepad, or something. And all you write down is one thing. Am I being the person that I want to be right now? Am I being the person that I want to be right now? That is such a good question. And keep it in front of you. When you're at home talking to your child, am I being the person that I want to be right now? When you're with your husband, wife, partner, am I being the person I want to be right now? When you're at work, you go in one meeting, it's a pain in the ass. There's a lot of hassles, you're angry. You go into the next meeting, let go. I'm not there, I'm here. Am I being the person I want to be right now? So, so those are, that's about it. And I'm gonna send everybody a copy of an article about this and some questions to think about. But every day, write down your questions. Every week, we have 50 people. We rotate them in groups of six or eight. 
every week they talk about how they score on each on these questions and other questions. And then they talk about what do they learn and what are they proud of? So I do this. I've done this for the past 10 weeks with 50 amazing people. And it's very sobering to do this. You realize we're all humans. It doesn't matter how fancy your bio is. We're all just humans and everybody's got their stuff to deal with. And, and more than half the time, the issues that come up are nothing to do with business. You know, my mother died. My kid has a brain tumor. Uh, a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with business. And if you think what's really important in people's lives, you hear this, you think, well, part of it's business, but part of it isn't. I had one of my participants had a big day today. She just sold her business to um, Blackstone uh, for um, 4.7 million, I think, Ancestry, at 4.7 billion, excuse me, Ancestry.com just sold Rounding error. Yeah. A billion, yeah. And another one, I should. She just sold her business to um, to uh, Amazon. Zook says car company to Amazon for it was only one point two billion. So, so boys and girls had a big couple of weeks. <laughs> what an exercise to keep us busy. All yeah. right, and by the way, it's not as hard as getting into a program at Harvard for an MD or anthropology, you can get this stuff if you choose to. It's simple. It ain't easy, but at least as you lay it out, pretty simple and straightforward. And if, by the way, if you really want to do it, get somebody to do it with you every day. Mm -hmm. If you try it by yourself, you're probably going to quit. Let's talk about this concept where everyone needs coaching, as you put right. it. But not everyone is coachable. I've right. learned that. How do you figure out who's coachable and who isn't? Well, in my job, it's pretty straightforward because they don't get paid if they don't get better anyway. They have to get feedback. They have to talk to people. They have to apologize. They have to follow up. They have to do the work. And if they don't do the work, I just don't work with them. Well, but, but you basically hire your clients just like a they, company hires any candidate. And we right. want to know if they're coachable before we pull the trigger. Of course. Have you gotten better pulling the trigger with the right people and repelling yeah, the wrong I, people? And how? Well, if they have the slightest degree of skepticism and say, well, I'm not sure this will work for me, you know what I say? I think you're right. Hmm. I think it probably will not work for you. That's very good. Hmm. <laughs> I, I don't convince anyone to do anything. No so more me, religious conversions. <laughs> no, no, no. My, my name is Marshall Goldsman, not Jesus Christ. I'm not here to convert people. And if they don't want to do stuff, it's okay. If you're really skeptical, that's good. You can be skeptical. You're probably right. It probably won't work for you. Probably a total waste of time. Fantastic. How's your philosophy evolved over the years? You've been in coaching now for what, 40? Over 40 uh, years? Yeah, my big breakthrough came when the client that I coached, I spent the least amount of time with improved the most. And ironically, the client I spent the most amount of time with didn't improve at all. So this humbly. So I made a chart on one dimension is called time spent with the coach Marshall Goldsmith, the other dimension called improvement. And there seemed to be a clear negative correlation between spending time with me and getting better. I thought, well, that was a troubling chart. So I go talk to my friend who improved the most, who I spent the least amount of time with. His name's Alan Mulally. Alan was the CEO of Ford when the stock went from $1 to $18.40. The stock went up 1,837% when he was a CEO. And I don't, know, I don't know what the number is. I think he got paid $400 million on the way out. And he's in a union company. Here's what's amazing. He had a 97% approval rating from the UAW company. All those employees, they knew he was a CEO. They knew how much he got paid. They worshiped the guy. Why? Save the company. So he's not only a great CEO, he's a great human being. He and I are writing some stuff together now. So I go to Alan. I said, Alan, Alan, of all the people I coach, you, you improved the most, but I spent the least amount of time with you. Then I showed Alan my chart. I said, you see, Alan, the way this troubling chart looks, had you never met me, you would really be good. <laughs> <laughs> So I said, what should I learn about coaching from you? And he said, you taught me two lessons. He said, number one, your biggest challenge as a coach is called customer selection. You pick the right customer, your process always works. You pick the wrong customer, God's not going to help these people get better. 
He said, two, never make coaching about yourself and your own ego and how smart you think you are. Make it about the great people you work with, how proud you are of them. Then he said, as a CEO of Ford, my job wasn't that different. I don't design the cars. I don't build the cars. I don't sell the cars. Got to have great people. And then he said, hey, every day I drive to work, I told myself, leadership's not about me. It's about them. Leadership's not about me. It's about them. Hmm. So back to your question earlier, that's the biggest challenge. For the great achiever, it's about me. For the great leader, it's about them. Everyone I work with has been a great achiever. Mm -hmm. it's hard it's hard to stop so it's all about them may be the answer to this curiosity question i've got i've heard amazing things about alan Mulally like from you and from other friends of his someone mentioned he's a, a really informed libertarian libertarians don't tend to love politics but yet the companies he and and people you coach run they're as big as some countries and bigger i mean you're basically a politician when you're ceo how he doesn't get involved. Doesn't he, doesn't, he doesn't get involved in macro politics at all, nor do I. No, nah, but even politics within a company, right? I mean, there's so Oh, I can tell he deals with that. Oh, not. real simple. Let me tell you what he did the first day at yeah. Ford. He had a long list of people who wanted to talk to him. So this woman, Mary, what does she want to talk about? She wants to talk about Joe. So Alan immediately had a meeting with his team. You know what he said? I mean, have no one-on-one -on -one conversations where people talk about anyone else. Now, you had a problem with Joe, you talk to Joe. Now, if you and Joe can't work it out, it's okay. Come talk to me. I am not going to have you talk about Joe behind Joe's back. I'm not going to have Joe talk about you behind your back. That stops. Well, guess what? He saved a lot of time. <laughs> he saved a whole lot of time because he just said none, zero. He said in eight years, Eight times in eight years did two people come to him and say, we can't work it out. He said, that's okay. It only happened about once a year, not five times a day. He just said, no. So how does he deal with politics? Real simple. There isn't any. He said, we're not here to bum wrap people. We're here to help each other. And by the way, here's the rules of how we talk. Here's the way we deal with each other. Now, Alan did something that I've never seen any leader do before. He got together with a team and they had, here's our values, here's our desired behavior. I've seen that plenty of times. He did something different though. He said, starting today, whatever happened in the past is over. It's all done. We're not going backward here. Whatever you did, you did. All sins are forgiven. Starting today, this card is the rules. You don't, don't, want, don't want to live this way. Starting today, leave. Sure enough, one guy goes over his head to Bill Ford as a chairman says, Bill, this is childish Boy Scout nonsense. If I want to make sarcastic jokes, I will. Who is this clown? Bill said, talk to Alan. Alan said, hey, it's okay. That's what you want. I'm the CEO. I made a decision. I made a choice. You made a choice. Goodbye. Next guy. Goodbye. That was it. Two people out 14 of the 16 people that turned the company around were the same people that led the company into bankruptcy. What was the difference? Him. Him. He was the difference. And by the way, how about politics? Not so much, because you know why? You're gone. How about gossip? No, nah, not so much. How about saying bad things about other people? No, nah, we don't do that. Pretty simple. Love it. You yeah. tend to focus on larger companies. My world's mostly at this point over the last seven-ish years been companies under a billion dollars in revenue. They tend to be less political, I think, meaning, and by politics, I mean, you think about how what you say is going to impact your own career advancement, your prospects for climbing up that ladder. Yeah, yeah. How, how political are most of the organizations you run up against? Oh, I mean, every organization is political. And by the way, every... See, we're, we're all basically full of shit in terms of the way we think of ourselves. In one way in particular, everybody asks people, how about playing favorites? Is that a good idea or bad? Oh, very bad. Playing favorites, bad. Politics. How about teaching people to suck up? Oh, no, hate suck ups. Oh, hey, hate suck up. Not me. Other bad leaders do that. You see, oh, no, 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 me. Then I ask the same people the question, uh, how many of you own a dog that you love? That's me. And say, oh, what's your dog's name? Or Spot or Fido, whatever. 
And I'm saying, I have a question. Who gets the most positive recognition in your family? Your wife, your husband, your kids, or your dog? Who gets the most unqualified positive recognition in 80% of all families? You know what the answer is? Dog. Then I say, well, do you love the dog more than your wife there or your husband? Oh, no, 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 no. Well, then how come the dog gets all the recognition? Well, the dog doesn't talk back. And that dog doesn't criticize me. And, and when I come home, the dog's happy to see me. And I, I come home late, why the dog is still happy. And I come home late and drunk, dog doesn't care. <laughs> the dog is a suck up. And what behavior do we reinforce? And by the way, we all do this. It doesn't matter if it's a small company or a big company. We all do this. And by the way, almost none of us ever admit it. Uh, we, we don't admit it, but we all tend to do that. Say, I ask people, how many of you have more than one kid? How many of you have one kid that goes, Daddy, Mommy, I love you. Another kid that's a wise guy. What kid gets the most recognition? Kid that acts like a dog. So we all tend to reinforce people that reinforce us. And what I teach people, and this works in any size company, is rank order the people who report to you four ways. Number one, how much do they like me? You don't know how much they like you. How much do you think they like you? Number two, how much are they like me? How much do they remind you of that? How much do they remind me of that wonderful person, me? Number three, what's your contribution to the company and your customers? And number four, how much recognition do you give them? If we're honest with ourselves, in about 15 to 20% of the cases, recognition is more highly correlated with one or two than it is with three. And we're probably falling into a trap we don't like in others. What's that trap? Encouraging people to suck up to us. How about clients? You got to play favorites when it comes to clients. When you choose your clients, arguably the biggest decision anyone makes as an entrepreneur. How do you go about choosing your best clients? The question is this. Again, I get paid for results. And am I going to work with someone who's going to benefit from this process or not? Because if they're not going to do it, I don't get paid. Mm -hmm. I'm wasting my time. i tell you one story. It's, it's very interesting. This was GE many years ago. Jack Welch was the CEO back then. And, and this head of HR calls me, wants me to coach this guy's running a division. Well, I described that you have to get feedback and apologize and follow up and all that. So then they call me back and say, well, he, he wants to work with you, but uh, he doesn't want to do those things. So I said, no, 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 no. I said, that's not to happen. I don't get paid if you don't get better. He's not going to get better anyway. I'm going to waste time. They call back again. Oh, forget the pay for results thing. We'll pay you anyway. I said, no. So you know what the guy said? He said, well, you can't say that. I said, yeah, you see, I can say that. You see, in America, we have this uh, anti-slavery clause. I think I can say that. And by the way, we have freedom of speech. So the answer is, I do not have to hire you. No. They call me back two days later. You know what the guy said? Thank you for saying that. This went up to the big boss. You know what the big boss said? The guy's not going to get feedback. He's not going to apologize. He's not going to follow up. Why are we wasting time with this clown? Out. He said three of the top people in the division said, we were going to quit if you didn't get rid of that idiot. Well, sometimes you just have to stand up and say no. It's incredible. So this is who makes the cut as a client of yours. But now if we look at the spectrum and say, you've got some clients that are, by whatever measure, even better clients. Alan Mulally, right? Francis Hesselbein. What makes yeah. the former president of the Girl Scouts, who we had an epic dinner with one night. If you remember, we had to practically carry her to her car. <laughs> I know. She's, she's, a, uh, she's 104 now. <laughs> that was after two or three bottles of champagne. Oh, so yeah, I know. What, what no, is no. it that, that, that makes these incredible, incredible clients of yours? Well, you know, it's basically people like let me, those two you mentioned, Alan and Francis, I'd put them right at the top of the charts. They're just amazing human beings. And let me just give you a couple of reasons why. How many times have I ever heard Alan Mulally or Francis Hesselbein, each of whom I've known for like 30 years each, how many times have I heard them complain in 30 years? Zero. How about poor me? Zero. How about I'm a victim? Zero. How about it's not fair? Zero. How many times have they ever been down? Zero. 
they're just alike. It's showtime. Every day they go to work, it's showtime. I am up. I am positive. I love what I do. I love the company. We're going to make a big difference in the world. Every day. Not only every day. I mean every hour. And I've, I've seen them all. I've seen them a lot of on personal times. We've had parties together. You know, Francis and I, God knows how much time we spent together. And, you know, she doesn't change. Alan doesn't change. A funny story. He was at Ford, right? And they were bankrupt when he got there. So one woman comes in after a few months and he's got one of those stress balls. He's squeezing the ball. And the woman says, well, thank God. I've never seen you act tense at all. It's good to know that you have the tension. And like the rest of us said, oh, that. He said, no, I, I played tennis and I hurt my hand. And, and my, my doctor told me to squeeze the ball. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome no. there's there's a 95 year old version of us that you introduced us to you said guys and this was the first day i met you right. imagine this 95 year old you if you could be right. with that person what advice would that person have for you about what matters and what doesn't and man did that give people some powerful insights what other tools, perspectives, games, exercises can really get someone to get in touch with a totally different perspective? Or is that the only one? No, let me give you another one. It's in my next book. It's called The Earned Life. Most of, I'm a Buddhist, so most of what I teach is kind of Buddhist stuff anyway, but this is very Buddhist. So the Buddhist philosophy is every time I take a deep breath, it's a new me. So take a deep breath. You think, new me, new me, new me. Everything that happened before this second in your life was done by an infinite set of people. Their names were the previous use. So think of the previous use. Think of all the gifts they've given to you that's listening to me right now. Think about how hard they tried. And think about all the nice things they did for other people. If anybody did all those nice things, what should you say to those people? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, did they make some mistakes or two? Ah, let go. So when you think this way, the first part of it is relieving. It's easier to forgive the, for yourself. And I tell people, look, I've asked a zillion people around the world this question. My child grows up, I want my child to be. What's the number one word? by far more than every other word combined in any country, happy. You want your kids to be happy? You want your people you love to be happy? You want your parents to be happy? The people who work with you to be happy? You go first. You want them to forgive themselves? You go first. You forgive yourself. So the first part of the exercise is thinking about all the previous use. And really putting you in that mood of saying, wait a minute, thank them for all they've done. Now, here's the challenge with the exercise. So the Josh I'm talking to right now, you have achieved absolutely zero. You have done absolutely nothing. Everything you have was given to you by a long, name, long group of people called the previous Josh. They gave you a lot. You haven't done anything. In many ways... The younger versions of us, these people are our parents. They've helped create us. They're our parents. The older versions of us, they are our children. They're our children. Well, think about right now, you haven't achieved anything. You've just been given things. You know, one of my CEO sessions where we talk about what are you going to do with the rest of your life, one of the guys had a sad story. He said, I worked 43 years so hard, and I had one goal. I worked so hard so my children would never have to work as hard as I did. And then he said, it's the worst thing I could have ever done for myself or for my children. They're not grateful. They're spoiled. They have no ambition. I ruined my own children. Very sad. Well, what he should have said is, I'm not giving you a gift, I'm giving you an investment. And I expect a return. I'm going to bust my ass to give you opportunities I haven't had. But I want you to do something good for the world. I want you to be grateful. I want you to be humble. 
And if you don't want to, why am I killing myself here? He gave them a gift when he should have made an investment. Well, think about your own life. Think about the future use. The previous use put you in this position where you are right now. Think about the next year. What are the investments you want to make in that year one year from today? And what do you expect back from the one year that one year from today? What do you expect from that person? Are you willing to work hard to help that person? Okay. Why? What do you expect from that person? What do you expect that person to do with that investment? And one of the most moving stories I had using this example is that my mentioned Dr. Jim Kim, who was part, head of Partners in Health, and they literally saved about 20 million lives. And if anybody in life could say, I deserve a pass, it's him. He's done so much good for the world that, you know, anybody deserves a pass, it's him. If anybody's in a position to say, I can coast, it's him. When I told him the story about the parent being the previous use and the children being the future you, you know what he said? I hope I make mommy and daddy proud. Very touching. I hope I can make mommy and daddy proud. So it's a great way to look at life. Mm. Truly profound. Every moment that question is with us if we opt for it. Wow. So you get <clears throat> powerful insights into how someone can get better or in the incredibly precise, unambiguous words the author of the New Yorker article I met you through wrote, you help fucked up people get unfucked up. <laughs> And how do they figure out where they're fucked up? Well, the 360 makes it pretty clear. What if we want to figure it out for ourselves? I'm the only person, that ever, I'm the only person that ever used the word fuck three, three times in one sentence that was published, as you recall, in the New Yorker magazine. <laughs> the exact quote was, it's easier to get unfucked up than figure out where you are fucked up, so why don't you just get unfucked up? That was published in the New Yorker magazine, <laughs> verbatim. I have a funny story. Do you know who David Chang is? The chef, he's a famous restaurant guy, Dave Chang. Anyway, Dave Chang is one of the most popular websites and our blog, a podcast. So it's, I'm on with him this last week. He's hilarious. Anyway, the same woman that wrote the story about me wrote the story about him, and he swears all the time. So it's, it's funny. I, I talked about Dave, and I said, you know, did you make that up, or was he really that bad chef? He was worse. <laughs> he was worse. <laughs> Uh, oh well. Uh, let go. So anyway, he can get no, coaching on a lot of things from you, but cursing less is not one. No, of them. Not we, one. we did. We did coach someone on that, if you remember. Yeah, we did. So you know, whatever. So no, anyway, so, anyway. So, so let's say someone wants to figure out where they're screwed up, and yeah. they want to figure it out for themselves. They don't want to rely on other people. How can we figure out what the best opportunities, the richest opportunities for improvement are on our own? I already know the richest opportunity for, our, for that person. You don't even have to tell me what they want to work on. I already know it. You know what the no, problem for yourself, is? You for Marshall, me for Josh. How can we figure oh. this out for ourselves? Oh, how to figure it out for ourselves. Well, the, one, the biggest problem with that hypothetical person you mentioned is they don't want help. You've identified their problem before you start. Anybody that thinks, say, look, I wrote a book called Triggers. The main point of the book is we overestimate willpower. And we are, and, you know, our odds on doing anything by ourselves are grossly. They, I have someone call me every day. I can't do it by myself. God knows I need help. You know, hey, how many of the top 10 tennis players have a coach? 10. So we all need help. Now, here's what I'm going to do for the world or try to do for the world to answer your question. So I went to this program. Uh, called Design You Like to Love with Aisha Bursell. So the story begins where she said, um, uh, who are your heroes? So my heroes like Alan Mulally is a hero of mine and Francis Hesselbein is a hero. You've met some of my heroes and Jim Kim is a hero of mine and Peter Drucker and Warren Bennis and Richard Beckhardt. And she said, these are great people that taught me so much for free. She said, you should be more like them. So I decided to adopt 15 people, teach them all I know for free. Only price is when they get old, they have to do the same thing. So I made a little thing and put it on LinkedIn. 
I thought 100 people would apply and I'd adopt 15. So far, 18,000 people applied for adoption. And I've adopted 200 and something. And then I'm talking to the same woman and she's, keep talking. I came up with a new idea. Here's my new idea. I'm going to give everything away. All I know to everybody I can. So in the concept of legacy, overall, I'm very proud of doing a lot for legacy. I give myself A plus on legacy. I mean, I have this hundred coaches. I've sold millions of books and everything's online. Yet I can do better. I'm going to try to package everything I know, make it all for free. Give it to corporations, they can use it for free. Give it to nonprofit, you can use it all for free. Uh, give it to individuals, they can use it for free. Give it to teams, they can use it for free. And so I'm now made a LinkedIn thing about that. 380,000 people viewed that. And you know how many people send me emails so that they would help me out so far? 2,700 emails, people said, I'll help. So it's very touching, very touching. So, you know, I'm going to give everything away for free. And what I also want to do, though, is make it not just me, that people like me. You know, they're older, they've had a good career, they've been great thinkers or whatever. They don't need any more money. Just give everything away. So I think it's a very positive, positive thing. And and then I have a nonprofit, and we have another rule. If you want to donate money, you can, but there's no credit for it. There's no acknowledgement you've donated money. Everything is anonymous. There's no blue circle or silver circle or all that crap, right? If you want to give money, fine, but you're not going to get any credit for it. If you want to do it just to do it, do it. And you want any credit, don't bother. No acknowledgement. So it's a really fun idea. So the idea of this is just give everything away to as many people as I can. And, and uh, one thing about Buddhists is we're very good at facing death. I'm 71. I'm not going to be here forever. Give away everything I can to as many people as I can in the limited time I have left to do it. This is a theme that runs through so much of what you do. Giving it away, letting it go, even embracing death. What guidance do you have on how we can get better at letting go of stuff. We've got the breath. What else can we do? They say we're in the era where learning is less important than unlearning. How do we unlearn? How do we let go? Forgive yourself and other people for being who they are. You know, how much, how much of dialogue is pissing on people for being who they are? And for what? What's the game? Just forgive me. You don't have to agree with people. Just forgive people for being who they are and forgive yourself for being a human. Uh, it sounds pretty simple. Yeah. What percent of all dialogue is, you know, talking about somebody screwed up or they have problems or let's talk about what's wrong with somebody else. And why? If you can do something about it, great. And if you're not, let it go. In my book, Triggers, I have another question to ask yourself before you deal with any topic. Am I willing at this time to make the investment required to make a positive difference on this topic? Am I willing at this time to make the investment required to make a positive difference on this topic? The answer is yes, you do it. Go for it. The answer is no, let it go. How much of our lives have been spent on topics we're not going to change? Why? It, Peter Drucker said, we're not here on earth to prove we're smart. We're not here to prove we're right. We're going to make a positive difference. If you're not going to make a positive difference, why are you spending your time? Mm -hmm. This wisdom is not just for our CEOs, by the way. So many of us are parents. Everything you're sharing clearly applies to our kids. Model, right? Whatever it is you want your children right. to embrace. Other than modeling and perhaps coaching and nurturing our children. Any other parenting wisdom you've got? Yeah, be careful about how you talk about your own parents. Especially in front of your children. So many of us say bad things about our parents in front of our children. What are we teaching our children to do? Mm. Say bad things about parents.
Also, uh, if your parents are still alive, you ask your parents a question, what can I do to be a better son or a better daughter? I was teaching my class and a woman in the Kaiser Permanente company in front of a thousand people, she raised her hand. She said, you know, I've been to your class twice. I've read everything you've ever written. There's always something you left out. I said, well, what was that? She said, I, I went home after class and you told me to ask my kids how I could be a better mother. And I did. And we had such a great discussion. My daughter was 17. It was so nice. Then she asked me, how can I be a better daughter? That's such a nice question. I thought we had a nice talk. I should call my mother. So she said, I called my mother and asked her, what can I do to be a better daughter? Then she said, my mother said, daddy's dead. I live alone in the country. And every day I take a long walk up the road to go to the mailbox. And almost every day there's nothing in the mailbox. And, and you know, every day that makes me very lonely. It would mean so much to me if you'd send me a little picture, a card, or something. So when I would walk to the mailbox, there'd be a little something in my mailbox. So she sent her mother little pictures and cards every day. What did that cost her? Nothing. What did that mean to her mother? Everything. She sent me an email a few years ago and said, my mother just died. The last thing her mother told her was, thank you. Thank you for doing that. If your parents are alive, this is very nice for three reasons. Number one, it's good for them. Even if they say you have nothing to improve, they will be proud that you cared enough to ask. Number two, it's good for you. What's the number one regret kids have when mom and dad die? Why didn't I thank them for all they did to help me? Why was I judging them all the time? And number three, again, if you have children, it's good for your children. Why? The old people you're calling up on the phone, guess what? You're going to be the old people. You want your kids calling you up on the phone? Your little child is not going to listen to what you say. Your little child's going to watch what you do. Our values are not what we say. Our values are what we do. Mm. Timeless wisdom here. What's changed over the years? as you've looked at corporate cultures. I mean, so much of this is evergreen. It's the kind of stuff a thousand years from now, I can't imagine they'd be right. sharing any different advice around. But it seems like just in the 20 years since I've been in the working world, people are more filled with pretense and concern around how they appear than how they are. Any shifts you've seen in culture or in corporate cultures over the years? Yeah. Actually, I think leaders are better than they've ever been by far. Here's what's happened. The expectations have changed so much. So I get this ridiculous question. Are leaders more bullies now than ever before? That is the most ridiculous question in the world. Hello. We used to have things like kings and queens and slavery and beating people. And, you know, that is such a ridiculous question. Leaders are so much better than they ever were. The expectation of the employees is totally different today. Let me give you an example. I worked with CEOs in a lot of hospitals before. Now, in the old days, the senior doctors would yell, scream, demean people every day. That was life. They can't do that anymore. So I was working with the head of a hospital two days ago, and I told him, no, you, you can't do this stuff. Those days are gone. You have to bring in the senior doctors and say, listen, if you do that, out. We, that's not the way we do things anymore. And I don't care what old Dr. Jones did when you were young. And I don't care if, you know, look, I had to put up with this. So do they No, that's over now. We don't do that anymore. So the role with how we treat women, how we treat minorities, it's a different world. And I think very important to recognize that in many ways, it's a much better world than it was. The expectations are so different today. The expectations are very different today. So leaders are actually, they get much more negative feedback for being arrogant or bullies or whatever. In the old days, they got no negative feedback for anything. So it's not like leaders are worse. It's just the expectations are so much different today than they've ever been before. It's not easy to be a CEO today, I can tell you. It's, <laughs> You know, you know the old saying, it's lonely at the top? It used to be lonely at the top. It's a lot lonelier at the top right now. These people have no one to talk to. They have no one to talk to. Anything they say can be put online. They can be made fun of. Uh, 
it's hard. It's a very lonely life out there. So that's why I like our meetings with the 50 people. We meet with eight or 10 different ones in groups all the time. They have someone to talk to where they can be a human being. Mm. Reminds me of Manhattan. It's so crowded, but it's at the same time, the loneliest place in so many ways. People operate in their little islands. How, how come it's hard for people to get feedback? You've built a career around helping people elicit strategies and suggestions from others. Feed forward is what you help them get. Why yeah. is it hard for us to take feedback for those who don't have the benefit of Marshall and your philosophy and your exercises and they just have feedback? Why is it hard? And is there something Number we can one, do to make that easier? Well, two dynamics. One dynamic, it's hard to give any leader feedback no matter what they say. In the history of the human species, two things don't go together. Get ahead in life and critique bosses. You know, if you look at the history of the world, how about critiquing bosses? How does that work out for people? <laughs> you know, it's, it's a bad plan. So we have been conditioned. It's almost genetic that we have learned not to critique power figures. Because in the history of the world, you got killed for that, right? So it's very, very deep not to critique people with power because you get punished. Well, the other thing is hard to hear feedback. And so it's, we all tend to reject or deny anything that's inconsistent with what we believe. Well, most people are very successful, have a very positive self-image. All of a sudden you get feedback that's not so good. What do you think? Well, I'm, I'm, I did this, I'm a success. I must be a success because I did this, you're wrong. As opposed to I did this, I am a success because I did many things right and in spite of blatantly screwing things up over here. Maybe you're not wrong. Well, it's in easy to understand that in theory. So what I teach people, number one, I never have any CEO ask for personal feedback at all. Never. They get confidential feedback. They don't ask for one-on-one -on -one feedback for two reasons. One, they don't want to tell you. And two, you don't want to hear it. Other than that, it's a great idea. You don't want to hear it. I mean, it's bullshit if I want negative feedback. The only people who like negative feedback are liars or masochists, right? Yeah, I like negative feedback. You're either a liar or you're a masochist, one or the other. Nobody likes negative feedback. That's such a crock, right? No, oh, I like negative feedback. No, you don't. No, you like to talk about negative feedback. You like negative feedback that's not threatening to you. You don't like negative feedback about anything important. None of us do. So don't ask for it. So every leader I get, they get confidential feedback from a variety of people, so it's a lot harder to deny. Then after that, everything is feed forward. Now, how does feed forward work? Feed forward, everyone asks for ideas. You treat the idea like a gift. Buddha said, only do what I teach if it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, don't do it. You treat it like a gift. And you say, thank you, and you don't talk. You shut up and you just say, thank you. So you say, I want to be a better listener. I'm not going to ask you for feedback about the past. Give me ideas for the future. Well, then you shut up and you say, thank you. Then you say, I'm not going to promise to do everything. I'm going to listen and do what I can, and I'm going to follow up and make sure I'm getting better. That's about it. Hmm. Marshall, you've been an incredible force for the CEOs in our ecosystem, for their growth, for a better life, for better families. Tremendous thanks for everything you've done.